grown all over these mountains, is one of the weirdest plants you'll ever see. It's a strange type of giant maize that grows up to 20 feet tall. These disconcerting finger-like things are its roots, suspended meters off the ground, and they ooze with a gooey mucus. And it's this mysterious mucus that could help feed the planet and end farming's toxic reliance on chemical fertilizers. This is the holy grail. As long as scientists can crack its code. This is the town of Totontepec in southern Mexico. For centuries, possibly even millennia, this maze has been meticulously cared for by the indigenous farmers there. Nos contaron nuestros antepasados, nuestros abuelos, que pues el maíz lleva mucho más de dos mil años. Empecé a cultivar de los trece años. Jugábamos con esa gelatina que daba pues la raíz desde muy pequeño pues no no sabíamos qué tenía o por qué se le salía. Para nosotros este significa mucho nuestra semilla. Es bueno, no tienen otros pueblos, otros países como de nosotros. But word about this mysterious giant corn eventually reached the ears of curious scientists. One of those was Howard Yana Shapiro, who was living in Oaxaca all the way back in 1980. I hear they have giant maize. So the word giant maize, you know, kind of intrigued me. The, the maize that was growing was 16 to 18 feet tall. You know, a normal maze that you see across America might be eight to 10 feet tall, but this was gigantic. I, I just couldn't believe it. Seeing something that was mythical, and in many ways it was mythical. On the surface of the roots, in a period when a maize plant would need nitrogen for that explosive growth, there was a mucilaginous material, really thick, very viscous, and we would watch it and it would auto dose itself essentially. And this mucus appeared to be allowing the plant to self-fertilize, meaning the farmers barely needed to add any artificial fertilizer. The idea that a maize plant could make its own nitrogen sounded like science fiction to virtually everyone we talked to. And to understand the reason why, you're gonna have to get used to a very important term. Nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen is essential to all plants. It's a major component of all proteins and chlorophyll. We're literally surrounded by nitrogen. The air is 78% nitrogen. Great, except it's not because almost all plants apart from legumes can't convert this lovely nitrogen from the atmosphere into the ammonia that it can actually use. And the reason this is such high stakes is about way more than corn. The world's population is literally fueled by cereal grains. Wheat, corn, rice, sorghum, millet, barley. These make up more than 50% of the world's diet and none of them can fix their own nitrogen. So we spray huge amounts of nitrogen rich fertilizer to plug the gap great for delivering bigger yields and helping to feed the planet's 8 billion people. Terrible for the environment. Unfortunately, most plants, uh, when we apply the fertilizer, only take up about half of it. It pollutes the water table. There's huge eutrophic sections of the Gulf of Mexico, which are dead zones caused by nitrogen. And that's not all. Fertilizer isn't cheap. So in some parts of the world, farmers can't even use fertilizers at all, meaning lower yields and less food to feed people. Wouldn't this be great if you didn't have to apply nitrogen in ammonia form? Wouldn't it be great if this impacted the production in the global south where they don't have access to fertilizer particularly? Hell yes. So you have a scientific motivation, you have an ecological motivation, you have a financial motivation. All of these come together when you try to solve a systematic problem. So. That's the prize. But it's time to go back to Mexico. Mexico is the birthplace of corn, home to more than 50 varieties. But the one with the ability to fertilize itself is called Oloton. And even in Mexico, this remained a relatively well-kept secret for centuries. When Howard first came across it in 1980, it still took him nearly 30 years to get the right team together to study it. So we started working with the community. We started doing all the kind of research. Let's establish facts. And we engaged the community extensively. We built a lab there. We had people from the community actually working for us. Together with Mexican scientists and the town of Totontepec, they studied how this slimy mucigel helps the plant to self-fertilize and grow so tall. They found that it's packed with nitrogen-fixing bacteria usually found in the soil. The gel itself acts like a sort of shield, creating a low oxygen environment that allows the bacteria to convert atmospheric nitrogen into a form the plant can actually use. This allows the plant to take up to 80% of the nitrogen it needs directly from the air. 
Finally, after a decade of research, there was proof of the agricultural holy grail, a self-fertilizing cereal crop. But almost immediately, some people started to ask, who owns the rights to an amazing plant like this? Some even went much further, labeling it as an example of what's known as biopiracy. So biopiracy is basically the idea that there is a misappropriation of biodiversity for research or the development of commercial products. And I always talk about this by thinking about Indiana Jones, right? So the idea that then, you know, somebody could swoop in to, uh, you know, biodiversity rich country, take a few plants, swoop out and discover the cure for cancer um, and make a lot of money. And um, yeah, and it was kind of, that was a happy ending, right? Well, wrong. Uh, and a lot of countries are saying, actually, this biodiversity is located within our countries and it's intrinsically linked to the culture and lifestyles of a lot of our indigenous peoples and local communities. So what does all this mean when it comes to Olaton? In, in Mexico, uh, an agreement was negotiated between a company and a local community in a way to secure uh, prior informed consent for this research um, and also to agree on sharing uh, some of the potential benefits. Every time that one seed is sold, half the value of the royalty goes to the community. Para mí es bueno porque de ahí aprendemos que el maíz de nuestro pueblo es el mejor del mundo porque últimamente no lo sabíamos. Como tanto nosotros como ellos también aprenden porque vienen a investigar acá muchas cosas y es bueno pues Tener algo que nos den algo. The village has been instrumental. We could have never done what we've done without them. They've been all in the whole way. It's fair to say that some are still definitely wary, especially because the agreement itself remains confidential. But in a way, all of this only matters if this scientific marvel can actually deliver on its promise, because it's not made any money just yet. Because for all the tantalizing promise of this self-fertilizing corn, farmers aren't going to grow it on a massive scale unless it can compete with current industrial scale corn. So researchers are currently crossbreeding it with other varieties, hoping to transfer some of its unique properties. They've already managed to almost halve the amount of time it takes to grow, and they've made huge progress on fixing nitrogen too. We can now fix about 40% of the nitrogen uh, from the air from just the local bacteria in the fields in the United States. So this this plant is recruiting the bacteria to fix nitrogen from the air, and 40% is a good amount. Probably three or four generations away from a stabilized hybrid maize. But the future of this is not just about corn. So now the scenario is nitrogen fixing maize, nitrogen fixing rice. What's next? Wheat? Then let's do millet, which is used in many parts of the world. How about barley? All of that is open now for discussion. In a perfect world, all crops would, would fix their own nitrogen and we would reduce the amount of fertilizer that we need. So the future for nitrogen fixing cereal crops is looking bright. Hopefully in my lifetime, nitrogen fixing maize commercially available around the world. But in our increasingly monocultural world, the fact that a little-known maize from a misty mountain in rural Mexico has been kept alive by small-scale indigenous farmers and could now help tackle world hunger points to another inescapable thing. We cannot talk about biodiversity as something separate than people. People use biodiversity, people care for biodiversity, people depend on biodiversity. And, you know, the idea that there is this wealth of knowledge and possibilities around biodiversity is really such a wonderful connection between people and nature. And we must find a way to be able to tap into this potential in a way that we are all benefiting. Because as much as the science is amazing, it's equally amazing that it's only thanks to this small community in the mountains of Oaxaca, who have preserved this rare plant with such care, that we're even able to get excited about it at all. These worms are literally eating their way out of this plastic bag. But not only can they eat it, it's actually good for the planet. So if they can biodegrade plastic, could they be the answer to our planet's massive plastic problem? Biology has found a way to some extent to deal with this. Because the latest science on this is mind blowing. Not only might we make plastic biodegradable, we might even one day be eating vanilla ice cream from recycled plastic and E. coli. Yes, I mean, it's chemically identical. Yeah, so we'll get back to that in a minute. Let's start with the worms. 
These little creatures are waxworms. Dr. Federica Bertacchini is a molecular biologist, and she first witnessed this phenomenon when she chucked a bunch of waxworms in a plastic bag as a hobby side project. Because, well, who doesn't? I bumped into the waxworm accident because uh, at that time I was a beekeeper. Because they, they live in the, in the beehives. They are considered plagues by beekeepers. So I started cleaning the, my beehive, putting the worms in a plastic bag, and within a short time, I realized that they were making producing holes. The plastic started to degrade almost as soon as it touched the worms' mouths. So we thought, okay, maybe something coming out of the mouth. So we start collecting this liquid coming out. It's called it saliva, but it's the liquid coming out of the mouth. So in this saliva, we found two enzymes that can reproduce the effect of the saliva, meaning oxidizing polyethylene. And it takes a few hours at room temperature in a, in a watery solution. And the amazing thing is that the worms can even digest the plastic, breaking it down into something useful for the worm. The worm itself, when it eats the plastic and starts breaking it down, its guts react almost as if it was eating normal food. So that means that there's something happening with the physiology of the animal that extracts something out of this plastic biodegradation and it just continues as if it were a normal diet. That's Dr. Chris Lemoyne, who inspired by Federica's findings, also began looking into these worms. We found that the plastic allowed them to still retain all their fat and presumably uh, continue with their life cycle. Basically, these worms are fattening themselves up by whatever means necessary before they turn into moths, by which point they don't eat again, only reproduce. I always call them bags of gonads that can fly because that's all they do. So there's a race underway to figure out just how this mechanism works. That's the million or trillion dollar question <laughs> because once we figure that out, that's a trillion dollars worth of plastic we can degrade. Because as cool as the waxworms are, this is really about the specific combination of bacteria and enzymes that can break down plastic, something that's exceptionally rare in nature. So why is it so rare? Why is plastic so hard to break down? Well, in nature, most things decompose because bacteria breaks down the chemical bonds that hold a substance together. These enzymes and bacteria have evolved over millennia to break down whatever it finds in front of it. Then, plastic comes along. Here's a scene that has long since ceased causing any surprise. Dishes that bounce when they drop to the floor. Nowadays, it gets bad rep, but it's a total game changer for humanity. But nature's never experienced it before. Plastics are made up of long chains of polymers with very strong bonds. And one of the keys to breaking these bonds is through oxidation. That's what the worms appear to be doing with their saliva, introducing oxygen molecules to the plastic. And this is something that's achieved in the environment through light, for example, high temperature. And this is the bottleneck. It takes a while because, you know, the environment has its own timing. So the worms, uh, what they do, is just introduce molecules of oxygen. So in a few hours instead of months or years or whatever. So this is the, the, the it's, it's a way to overcome the bottleneck of this reaction. So what's next? Unleash the worms? Uh, no, that would be a terrible idea. Remember this? They are considered plagues by beekeepers. But even sticking just the plastic, the process is still way too slow to realistically solve our plastic crisis anytime soon. So stand down, waxworm armada. The real stars of this though are the enzymes. If the researchers can identify them and scale them up, there's a chance that in the future, this could be one of the solutions. It will take a lot of cash. <laughs> But now scientists are looking for similar enzymes in all sorts of other places. Super worms too. So anything that has a worm in it, it seems to be prone to eat uh, plastic. In fact, over 30,000 enzymes have been identified capable of digesting 10 different types of plastics. One bacteria found in cow stomachs can be used to digest polyester. But the one that's getting everyone really excited is a bacteria called Idionella sacaiensis. And especially its enzyme, Petes. Uh, plastics waste in general, but more specifically PT, has uh, infiltrated our environment and biology has found a way to some extent to deal with this over time. There was a discovery outside of Japan where they had found that microbes began to colonize on parts of a water bottle. The cells were actually living and maybe even surviving off the carbon within that plastic. We can take this enzyme out of the cell and we can begin to engineer that enzyme even further to be able to have better activity directly on plastic waste. Pet plastic that would take centuries to break down in nature, petes can break down in a matter of days. 
but it doesn't solve our plastic problem. Not yet, anyway. To have any real impact at scale, we need to turbocharge how quickly it works. And that's exactly what Hal's team has done. And they named this really fast version of Pete's, um, Fast Pete's. They did this using AI, essentially by using a vast database of all known enzymes in the natural world, and then running simulations about which combinations and mutations would speed up the process. Kind of like a form of computerized, accelerated evolution. Machine learning approach really is, it's rapid evolution to some extent on there, but at the same time, it's guided by observation. We saw that this enzyme was not very stable overall and used a machine learning type of approach to figure out which point mutations would make this enzyme more stable and found a couple of mutations that really both increased the stability significantly, but then also gave rise to a significant increase in the activity of this enzyme on plastic. This cutting edge technology opens up a whole new frontier of scientific possibility and the team aren't done yet. Thinking about trying to clean up plastic that's actually in the environment. Those applications don't have the benefit of being able to control the temperature and pH very well. So having an enzyme that ultimately is flexible enough to work in a variety of different conditions is extremely valuable. Once PET plastic is broken down into its component parts, tereptalic acid and ethylene glycol, it can then be recycled into new plastic. But it doesn't necessarily have to be plastic. In theory, it could be used to make something better. Like this. Well, sort of. Because a team of scientists in Edinburgh have found a way to turn plastic into vanillin. That's the central ingredient in vanilla. And they did it using E. coli. Sounds delicious. For me, and for anyone who's thinking about a nice vanilla ice cream, what what are we not understanding about that? We get asked this question a lot. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it's chemically identical. Okay, forgive me if the next part ruins vanilla for you. So vanillin is a compound that's derived from, from oil that we pump out of the ground. It's the same feedstock that we use to make petrol that we, that we use in our, in our cars. So we, in essence, took one of those enzymes that had been reported to do the initial depolymerization and then took the mixture of terephthalic acids and ethylene glycol that you get from that and simply just fed it to our E. coli. But the way that I think about it is, you know, yes, this compound is coming from plastic waste and yes, it's coming from a bacteria, but I think we as a society are okay with eating food that has oil in it, the vanillin derived from oil. So why wouldn't we be okay with having having a bacterium produce, produce that for us? Now, these guys aren't really trying to sell you vanilla ice cream. They're more interested in upcycling recycled plastic. There's recycling plastics into more plastics, and then there's upcycling plastics into other compounds. The issues at the moment currently with that approach is that when you subsequently recycle plastic into other plastics, the value of that plastic and the quality of that plastic actually diminishes. So you, you enter into this downcycling approach that does solve the problem in the short term, but it ultimately generates the same waste. What we think is quite interesting about upcycling plastic is you re-enter that carbon back into the, you know, the chemicals economy as something that's higher value. Vanillin is not the only product that we can make from pet plastic. The molecules that you get when you depolymerize PET um, are actually intermediates en route to a huge number of industrial products that we rely on nowadays. One of the most interesting ones that we're focusing on right now is, is pharmaceutical intermediates. You can take pet plastic waste and turn it into pharmaceutical compounds. So taking something that's actually damaging the environment and turn it into a source of human medicine. So medication, other flavoring compounds, materials for your clothing, cosmetics. It's quite staggering. I think this is only really the beginning of what could be possible in, in the area of plastics upcycling. I think that very much is the case. So worms themselves aren't gonna eat all our troubles away. But the science going on around this is genuinely exciting. And it's all thanks to nature for providing the inspiration. Imagine your dystopian future. Couple of overturned cars, crops can't grow, swarms of robots are the only signs of life. Pretty textbook Apocalypse 101. Except, what if it's not? What if those robots could be part of the solution to prevent global catastrophe? Robot bees. It's almost impossible to overstate the role that bees, actual bees, play in our world today. Nearly 75% of leading crops depend on animal pollination. Without them, we really would be heading for disaster. But bees have been in trouble for decades, mostly thanks to a toxic mix of habitat loss, pesticides, climate change and disease. The beekeepers across the United States have lost 
45% of honeybee colonies only between April 2020 and April 2021. That's insane. Honeybees are responsible for the one third of the crop we actually eat, right? So it's a big problem. So in one sense, we're already in our dystopian future and we need to find solutions. And for some, that means robot bees. Because in labs all over the world, the race is on to create robot bees capable of pollinating plants and revolutionizing agriculture as we know it. Even if it does still sound like a dystopian nightmare. But how realistic is it to make them in the first place? Because replicating what a bee does is a mammoth challenge. To pollinate a flower, a bee has to locate the flower, identify where the pollen is, navigate through all sorts of elements and obstacles, and then land delicately on the flower itself. That's a huge technological challenge, let alone cramming all that computing power into something as small as a tiny robot. But that's the task facing Chahat Singh at the University of Maryland. We are at a stage where we are have the brain of a bee, but at the size of a hummingbird. So we can do pollination in the wild, but for a certain specific flowers. But what we want is to do pollination for all the flowers in the world, right? And generally sunflower is like one of the biggest flowers that we can find. So if you want to pollinate the flowers, which are very small, we have to build something which is as small as a honeybee, which is probably gonna be like 100th of the size. Also taking on this robot bee challenge is Dr. Kevin Chen at MIT. If I look at the flower, it's just probably about a couple of centimeters. So I have, I have to have very good precision for the robot to approach a flower, gently land on the flower, and with very careful control so that it doesn't fall off. So trying to land on flower, approach a flower is very challenging control problem, but that's, that's something we are, we are uh, actively solving right now. But the latest robot bees are already capable of some impressive feats. They can fly in all directions, detect and avoid predators, flip 360 degrees, well, sometimes. And they can already identify specific flowers to pollinate. So we have an AI framework and it goes and searches and detects these flowers. Once you know which flower you want to pollinate, it has a control policy which says that, okay, I want to go down as close as possible. And on the bottom of the robot, we, there's a Velcro which extract these pollen grains. The next goal for Jahat and his team is to downsize this robot hummingbird closer to the size of a bee. But that's much easier said than done. Everything is a trade-off between computer power and size. And the major obstacle facing all robot bee pioneers is battery power on something so tiny. These drones currently have a battery life of about five to seven minutes because of the current state of batteries we have. So one of the things that excites me, how do you come up with this cognitive design which is very similar to the mind of the bee to actually get things working on that small of a scale. Because you can't just take an artificial intelligence framework that works on a bigger drone and just downsize it. Near future, I would say, I would definitely see the bees will be needed to work indoors in which they will be tethered to a power supply. Thinking about deploying a lot of them in the wild that having them pollinate really requires us to solve the energy or the power challenge first. So if you're really trying to either build more efficient bees, but also waiting for the next breakthrough in battery technology that allows us to, to have bees, artificial bees that can fly for a much longer time. But Jahat and his team do have an ingenious solution in the meantime. They're working on an autonomous robo bee hive, where a massive robot mothership of a drone can fly to a tree, attach, and then deploy its smaller robo bee babies out to pollinate. It's easier for the mother beehive to detect these uh, tree branches because it has the entire death maps that you see in most of the cell driving cars, right? So it goes and autonomously attaches or latches on and the mother bee commands these smaller bees. You find, you pollinate and you come back to the bee. And this entire pipeline is autonomous, right? So if you have a field of about a thousand stars, we would need about eight to 10 small robo bees which can go around the field and pollen 1,000 flowers in about five to seven minutes. But if the goal is essentially robotic pollination and the intricacies of both flight and power are proving so difficult, do we really need them to fly at all? That's what researcher Yu Gu is looking at with his team at West Virginia University. He's developing a ground-based robot that can pollinate flowers as they go up and down the aisle of an indoor farm. What we're doing is more like a 
human pollinating, hand pollinating uh, cucumbers in a garden. So if all goes as planned, with the extra computing power that something like this would bring, there's way more that you might be able to do than just pollinate. Yugu's robots would be able to monitor the plants at the same time and send back reams more data to make farming more efficient and deliver bigger yields. The ability to pollinate is also the ability to support many other tasks. So robots in some form are definitely part of the future of farming. But let's go back to the robot bees. Say all goes perfectly well. We resolve the battery power problem. Robot bees are now capable of pollinating fields worth of crops at a time. But swarms of tiny robots that could fly anywhere, record information undetected, and be controlled remotely, hmm, what could possibly go wrong with that? Apart from it literally being a Black Mirror episode. If, say, I'm an evil scientist, I want to do spying on people. From a serious scientist perspective, if I really want to do that evil thing, I probably wouldn't take Robo-V as my first candidate to do those. If I build a rotary vehicle, the aerodynamic efficiency is much higher than flapping wing. Given the current engineering constraint, I probably build a smaller quad rotor. So basically, there's better ways to spy on us. Great. Everything that the bee sees on anything that it sends is computed on the bee itself. And it's not sending these information to any other source and not relying on any other source to do this computation. That stops the risk of the hacking of these tiny drones. Marginally satisfying, although still relying on a fair bit of trust there. But personal security is not the only concern that people have raised. For a start, ecological waste and damage could be another unintended consequence. But it seems to me a bit of a flawed solution. They're going to break down, they're going to need maintaining. There's the risk of them being hacked into. Probably a much cheaper solution would be to look after real insects. We are the reason they're declining and we could use fewer pesticides, leave a little more habitat for them. We often overlook the really obvious simple solution and instead try to invent some really complicated technological fix. There's certainly no replacement for actual bees. It's estimated that nearly 600 billion worth of global crops depend on pollinators such as bees to grow. They're absolutely essential to global food production and saving them from collapse has to be a priority. But when it comes to robot bees, it's not exactly an either or scenario, as the researchers are keen to stress. We have no intention of replacing bees. We are looking for a solution which could aid or help honeybees. I think, you know, Trying to build robotic prototypes of smaller insects help us to understand insects and it can be beneficial for the biologists as well. Evolution has like 3.8 billion years of research and development. We should definitely learn from them. There are also other pollination scenarios where bees don't even exist in the first place. Like here. We're also thinking about if you want to do assisted agriculture experiment in space. In those cases, of course, now we are using humans, right? The astronaut will be doing the pollination, etc. But hopefully we can automate that process in the longer term. But it's not only about pollination for these robot bees. The researchers also dream of other exciting real world applications. The scenario that I want to give is, for example, there is an earthquake and the building collapsed and there are people who are trapped inside. What microscale robot can be very useful to search for how many people are trapped and where are those people trapped. And beyond search and rescue, they can also help us avoid other doomsday scenarios by going where humans struggle to reach, like inspecting weak spots in bridges or helping escape a nuclear meltdown. These tiny little bee drones, they can go near the surface of these power plants and they can look for the cracks and they can scan the entire thing to understand, okay, is there anything that needs to be repaired before we start this operation? So while swarms of robot bees might still be decades away, if they happen at all, it's clear that the technology is advancing rapidly. And although it's tempting to pitch bees against robot bees in some Hunger Games style winner takes all, that's not really the case. Actual bees are the real deal and need protecting. But robot bees may well have a part to play. What do you think the future will look like? This? This? Or will it look something like this? Climate change is transforming the way we think about the designs of our cities. We're typically used to thinking of the future as a shiny concrete jungle, but this is looking less and less likely, at least not until we've solved a huge problem first. This stuff, concrete, the foundation of, well, foundations. 
Concrete has a lot going for it. It's cheap, reliable, and so easy to use that basically anybody can be taught to work with it. So it's no surprise it became the defining architectural feature of the last century. So whether you're a fan of brutalism or you just think architects have actually been walling us in in a concrete prison, either way, concrete is a really useful material. Problem is, it's threatening the future of our planet because of its absolute dependency on fossil fuels. You couldn't possibly make it on anything like this scale without enormous fossil fuel inputs. So the search is on for alternative materials that can offset concrete's carbon footprint. And while looking ahead to the future, many are actually delving into the past for inspiration. But one thing does seem certain. We cannot build in concrete and steel any longer. So what exactly is so bad about concrete? Concrete is a big part of the problem. It's around 8% of all carbon emissions at the moment. These emissions are largely caused by one ingredient, cement. While cement makes up just about 10 to 15% of concrete's total mass, it accounts for up to 90% of its greenhouse gas emissions. But despite this huge carbon footprint, we're making massive quantities of this stuff. The total amount of cement we make on the planet every year at the moment would require you to cover an area of the size of Australia in woodland. But with a global population of nearly 8 billion, and an anticipated rise of 2 billion more over the next 30 years, the demand for housing, and by proxy concrete, is only getting larger. In the three years of its peak building boom of around 2013, China used more concrete by a long way than America had used in the entire 20th century. And that's the central conundrum of concrete. Whilst it's contributing massively to the rise in global temperatures, it's also difficult to find a sustainable alternative capable of building on such a scale. But one possible solution, a material that's both recyclable and plentiful, might be just beneath our feet. Mud. Mud brick construction has been around for centuries, but perhaps surprisingly, many of these old earth architecture structures are still standing firmly today, such as this, the Jinjerba Mosque in Timbuktu, Mali. Erected in 1327 and built almost entirely using materials such as fibre, straw and wood, and still standing today. It's a prime example of the durability of earth building. But how exactly does this method work? So earth building is a historic, traditional technique, and it's all about using some kind of soil in buildings. For the most part, that means subsoil. So that's getting into the mineral bit of the soil. There's always going to be some clay within that subsoil because clay is the sticky binder that holds everything together. The clay can then be easily moulded into different shapes for use in the walls, making it totally cement free and meaning it has drastically lower carbon emissions. But rammed earth also has another trick up its sleeve. It's excellent at regulating both temperature and air quality, keeping the inside cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Clay is a hygroscopic material, so it likes to take in moisture. When there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, it's absorbed into anything that's made of clay and then slowly released later. So it has this beautiful effect on humidity in any part of the house where it levels it off. This makes rammed earth a potentially attractive prospect when it comes to small residential units. But what about skyscrapers and high-rise flats? Can this ancient technique be unified with modern architecture? Well, the answer is complicated. There are stunning examples of earth architecture being utilized for tall buildings, such as the Yemeni town of Shibam, which was largely constructed in the 16th century and is sometimes referred to as the oldest skyscraper city in the world. Some of the buildings in this city of mud are over 30 feet high, and the fact they're still standing some 500 years later shows just how durable earth architecture can be. But unfortunately, this ancient material faces an equally ancient adversary, water. So where we might get a problem is, say if we had a leaking gutter, where there's constant water coming through, then eventually that little bit of water tracking through can break down the walls, and you can get bits of collapse that way. In Shabam, this water damage is mitigated by routinely applying fresh coats of mud. But this method of preservation is better suited to warmer climates. Not so much the constant rain that is typical of European cities, meaning the maintenance of large-scale structures may not be so viable. So to build our future skyscrapers, we may need to turn to a different material, timber. 
we need to think really carefully about how we can change the way in which we build. The technology exists, the materials are there, so this is an opportunity to really make a big difference relatively quickly. This is Andrew Waugh, who's designed the office group's black and white building, which is made entirely of timber. Standing at just over 58 foot high, it's the tallest mass timber building in central London. So you can see from this building, each one of these wall panels arrives on site millimetre perfect. So we're not throwing anything away at this building site. There are no big skips full of rubbish outside. And in the UK, about 50% of our landfill is just from construction. And the key advantage of timber is that it's regenerative. You can grow more of it. So it's not an extractive process. We're not scraping something off the surface of the planet of the Earth, which we will never be able to put back. Every tree that's cut down, five are put back in its place. Now you might be wondering about fire safety. And that's something that's certainly not lost on timber architects either, both the actual risk and the public perception. One of the primary issues that we face is a concern around fire. And we work very closely with fire engineers, with different research departments globally, so that we're really careful about how we instill those in our buildings. And I live in a timber building on the seventh floor with my family. This is very close to me, ensuring that the buildings that we build are safe. Timber seems like a genuinely exciting and viable solution to the future of how we build our cities. But there is a limitation. It's not going to replace concrete entirely, not least for major infrastructure projects. We will probably always need concrete, you know, for the infrastructure, for bridges, tunnels, for the foundations of the buildings that we build. But we need to transform the industry to one that vastly reduces the amount of carbon that it emits. The central issue all comes back to concrete. As long as it remains the cheapest, strongest, fastest and most versatile building material, which it is, we're not going to eliminate it entirely. So what if we don't have to abandon it altogether? What if instead there was a way to recycle it and make it more sustainable? And that's exactly what Dr. Pippa Horton has been working on. So I've got here a piece um, of one of the very first batches of cement that we produced. And how we make this is you take old concrete and you separate out from the concrete the aggregate and the sand. And what you're left with is old cement. And in order to turn that cement into new cement, it needs to be heated at very high temperature. So I'm using an electric arc furnace, which is a really hot furnace used for melting metal. And we put our old cement paste into that equipment, heats it up and, and turns it back into new clinker. And then we get to process it and recast it into, into new cement. Put simply, this means recycling the cement we have to produce new variants in an almost loop-like process. But with this cement being sourced predominantly from demolition waste, is there enough to make this viable? So there's enough demolition waste at the moment that we could meet the needs of about a quarter to a half of global cement using this production process. So it couldn't completely replace it, but it would do a pretty good job of meeting some of those needs without emissions. We're aiming and we hope that this process can be completely carbon-free and we eliminate all the emissions. We think we could save 500 million tonnes of CO2 a year from doing this process if we did it at full scale, so perhaps a couple of percent of, of global emissions, but they're really rule of thumb approximations. Innovations like this, trying to transform concrete from within, could be the key to making the future of construction sustainable. But beyond reusing concrete, there's also the option of reusing the things we've already built. It's called retrofitting, which is repurposing buildings rather than tearing them down and replacing them with more concrete. We have a very, very large stock of existing robust buildings. 80% of the buildings we'll have in 2050 are already up by a conservative estimate and almost all of them are performing really badly in energy terms so we need to sort them out. Sorting out an existing building is very much lower carbon in almost all cases than building a new one. It's very unlikely there'll be a one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to concrete. So rather than our future cities looking like sci-fi utopias or dystopias depending on your particular aesthetic, our future skylines are likely to look more like a collage with exciting new innovations sitting alongside some of the surprisingly durable techniques from far back into human history. An exciting way to keep history visible, while also ensuring we don't demolish the future in our rush to keep building. Ah, coffee. The fuel that powers the global economy by keeping us awake through all that unpaid overtime. The medicine that gets you through a meeting with your boss while horrendously hungover. Basically, you know it will always be there when you need it. Except, what if it's not? Because here's the thing. Coffee 
is going extinct. A combination of global warming, pests, and a nasty fungus called coffee leaf rust are threatening coffee as we know it. More than 60% of the world's wild coffee species are expected to be wiped out by 2050. But there's hope in the form of a long lost little bean recently rediscovered in the wild in Sierra Leone. It's called Coffea stenophylla, although it depends who you ask in terms of how to pronounce it. And it's called Coffea stenophylla. Stenophilia, I, I, I've been told that's incorrect. Or stenophylla. And there's also talk of another wild bean in Uganda, Coffea liberica, that's also promising to help fight back against climate change. And it's just as well, because the world is hooked on coffee. About 2 billion cups of coffee are consumed around the world every single day. It's an industry worth an estimated $500 billion, supporting some 100 million coffee farmers. Coffee is an extremely global crop. It is a major export for about 20, 25 countries, meaning the income that a country earns from coffee exports might help pay for roads and hospitals. Here's the thing with coffee. There are some 130 known species of coffee in the world. But all of that delicious elixir floating through our veins every day comes from basically just two types of bean. Coffea arabica and Coffea canephora, which we also commonly call robusta. For coffee snobs, arabica is basically seen as the nice tasting one you'd buy at an overpriced coffee shop. And robusta usually ends up blended into instant coffee. And it's arabica the nicer tasting one that's suffering most with climate change. It is very susceptible to diseases and pests, and it also has kind of a narrower environmental pocket that it thrives in. Arabica is hypersensitive to rising temperatures, and this is already having a massive impact on coffee farmers right now. Arabica is going to continue to decline in production. Farmers are facing more pressure from diseases, pests, and weather, and they need a plant that is more, more tolerant. So that's why people have started to reconsider some of the other hundred or so species of wild coffee looking for help. And there was one person who kept coming up in basically every conversation I had. If you have spoken to Aaron Davis. You speak uh, with Aaron Davis. Aaron Davies. So I went to Kew Gardens in London to speak to the man himself. How do you pronounce stenophylla or phylla or stenophylla? It's coffea stenophylla. There you go. Stenophylla. Glad we got that one sorted. It used to be widely consumed around Europe in the 19th and early 20th century. It was successful, it did pretty well for a number of years and then almost completely vanished overnight. But reports about it from the time captured the imagination of Aaron and his team. What they were saying is that the taste is, is excellent and that it, in some cases, is better than Arabica. Now when you hear that, it, you start to get excited. But even more intriguing was that it could withstand higher temperatures than Arabica and still survive. So it's not a cool tropical plant like Arabica, it occurs in the lowlands where it's hotter. And, and that starts to pose some questions around could it be useful climate change adaptation. And if that wasn't enough... There are accounts of it being resistant to coffee leaf rust. And coffee leaf rust is the worst disease of coffee. It annihilates countries. It causes farmers to go bankrupt very, very quickly. It's a terrible, terrible disease. If that were the case, that would be a big tick in the box for Stenophylla. Amazing. Problem solved. Except no one knew for sure that it wasn't already extinct. One of the only known existence of it were these samples right here, dried out and stuck to an old piece of paper from the 19th century. That sample right there in my hands is from the 1870s and was the biggest stash anyone knew about. So how do you find a long lost species that might not even exist? Well, Aaron and his team had to turn detective. They tracked down the last known sightings of it to some forests in Sierra Leone. But even some of the forests didn't exist anymore. So no luck there. And that turned up absolutely nothing. So they set off on foot into the surviving forest, hoping they'd get lucky. I mean, were you well, literally just going off hoping for the best? My job as a person that knows wild species is to find that plant in the forest. Because when you go into that forest, there's just many hundreds of plant species, it's dark. So you have to identify just from its leaves, which is, which is quite tricky. And then eventually, they found one. We often say that if we were doing this in 10 years time, there might be a chance that it, that it would actually be extinct in Sierra Leone. Now I turned up to Kew Gardens hoping to sample some of this mysterious coffee for myself. But as it turns out, I never stood a chance. So valuable is just the potential of this wonder bean to an industry worth half a trillion dollars that Kew Gardens can't keep it on the premises in any significant quantity because of the fear of bioespionage. The demand is so great 
for people wanting to grow this coffee outside of Africa or in other parts of Africa that we have to be very careful not to pass it on to other countries. But we also know that people have tried to steal this coffee. <laughs> this idea of people stealing it, um, is that from here, from Sierra Leone? I can't share any details <laughs> of the nefarious <laughs> recent history of Stella Vila, but we do know that attempts have been made to visit Sierra Leone and acquire the beans from illegal sources. I mean, our, our hope and our aspiration is that we can use Stenophyla to um, benefit the country where, it, where it's found. They're the, uh, the countries and communities that should be benefiting from this natural biological resource. So with good reason, I wasn't able to verify how good it tastes. But when this coffee was tasted by industry experts, it passed with flying colours. And that only adds to its allure as a potential saviour of the coffee industry. Okay, so how do we get from a promising little magic bean into actually transforming a multi-billion dollar global industry. Farmers aren't just gonna switch over to a new bean on a whim. So the next step for Aaron and his partners is a trial project, where they pay farmers in Sierra Leone to grow it and see how it performs, guaranteeing the farmer's income while they continue their research. But that's not the only thing going on with it. Many people see this as the wonder bean, um, and it ticks nearly every box that you would need from a really good coffee crop plant, but the yields are quite low. So what we see is that initially it will become a high value niche crop for those people, those people that are really into coffee, the real coffee geeks. Uh, but our aspiration is to use um, Stenophyla uh, in a breeding program to develop something that's commercially scalable. So that's where we are with Stenophyla for now. An exciting, possibly game changing prospect, but still some way off totally transforming the coffee industry. But if just one of these wild species offers such promise, what about the other 130 or so? Because it turns out Stenophyla isn't the only wild species that is offering hope of salvation. This is Catherine Kawuka. She's based in Uganda, where coffee makes up a crucial part of the economy. Uganda is gifted in terms of coffee. She's been researching another of those wild species, one called Coffea liberica, also known as Excelsa. And here something really exciting is happening because farmers are already switching over to using it of their own accord. It is a farmer-led initiative because they do exper experience these challenges. The drought spells are very intense and more frequent. So when drought hits, you're seeing farmers taking a decision to uproot all the robust coffee and plant more of Liberica coffee. It's quite resilient to drought, to common coffee pests and diseases, and also the yield is very, very promising. This species is the one that is sustaining our coffee production in such times when the droughts are intense and more frequent. This is our, our, our go-to species. The challenges we are seeing with climate change are asking us to rethink our coffee sector. Should we keep burdening it with only two species when we have a wealth of other species with full potential thriving in the world? And that's what it really seems to come down to, preserving as much genetic diversity as possible and maybe reinforcing the idea that actually we need to keep some of these around. If you lose stenophyll or if you lose Liberica or something else, then you lose an option. Some of the genetic diversity that is in some of these wild species may have really, there may be some really useful traits kind of hiding in these plants that may help us solve future problems. For example, like resistance to a disease that is not really known yet or really widespread on coffee farms. The potential for that might be in one of those 130 species. So we don't want to lose it. Right? Once it's gone, it's gone. But with such promise being shown by just two of the wild species that were previously slipping towards extinction, hopefully we might now do a better job of keeping the gene pool as biodiverse as possible and keeping our coffee flowing for good.